Hello, everyone. How are you? Hanging in there. Yes, indeed. All we can do. People are still joining us. And your name is Kelly, Sheila. Your name looks like it says Kelly Dewar. Oh, it oh, isn't that weird? Does. <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. Well, that's because Kelly shared a link with me to join the meeting, and I guess I don't know oh, what happened. Interesting. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I'll be Kelly. That that's okay. <laughs> okay, let me change my name. See if I can change my name. Yeah, if you go to the little dots up at the top, you should. It should say rename. Yeah, I think I need. Oh yeah, it is funny. All right, people are still joining us. Right, people are still hopping on. All right, people are still hopping on. Um, and I guess we can start with an icebreaker. Um, how about what is the most listened song in your life? What is the song you listen to the most in your life for today's icebreaker while people join us? Really good question. So are we going for the song that we intentionally listen to most in our life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Or up to you. Up to you. Or is there is there a different answer to that question? Are there songs you're not intentionally listening to a lot? Chris says ringtones. The ones that Pandora make us listen to over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Mine's really weird. It's a song that my son started playing this past weekend. <laughs> Which one's that? It's JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Golden Wind. Nice. Yes, it's very unique. It has a catchy tune from an anime cartoon, I think. I just heard a song called Doggy High Five. That's apparently really popular with young people right now. So um, hmm. Google that if you're, if you're interested. Van Morrison, I am there with you. That is, a, that is circulated in my life too. Death Cab for Cutie, cute. Oh, I love that song, Shelly if we were vampires. Mine's probably like a Paul Simon song, probably. Um, all right, well, I'm sure people will continue to join us. And Kelly, I'm gonna make you a co-host so we can both watch the door. Cool. Um, I am Super excited to introduce today's topic with Dr. Sheila Sagerson. Um, I first met Sheila ago, um, which is wild, uh, working as, working under Sheila um, in a dog foster program at Maddie's Fund. And Sheila is one of my absolute heroes and guiding light in this work. Um, and so I will 
uh, hand it over to you, Sheila, to introduce yourself and um, talk to us today about medication. Thank you so much, Ori, and likewise, you are a hero of mine too. I'm really happy to be here. I am a veterinary behaviorist whose uh, career focus is shelter animals, so I've been working in and with shelters for longer than I care to remember now, um, probably 25, 30 years. And um, my views have changed. Um, I'm someone who's forever interested in learning. I'm very grateful to have been working at Maddie's Fund for the past eight years. And today I'm going to share with you um, some brief things with regard to behavior medications in the shelter environment and, and considerations around all that. But I'm ever growing and evolving and what we might talk about today might change a month from now or a year from now. And I think that's one of the, it can be a frustration, but it's also one of the wonderful things about what we do is that we're always learning and growing. I'm gonna have a presentation, so I'm gonna share my screen. My screen is black. Can you guys see my screen? Oh, there we go. Can you guys see it? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, cool, thanks. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about behavior medications for shelter dogs and cats. Um, I have to say that I tend to be a little more dog focused. It's not because I don't love cats and I don't enjoy working with cats. Um, I do, just when it comes to talking about medications, I tend to use them with dogs more in the shelter environment than with cats, but cats are a very welcome part of this conversation. I'm gonna start this conversation by talking about assessing welfare because when we're considering medication, we should always be considering it because the goal is to improve our companions' welfare. And on the screen are a couple of the, the dogs I've worked with over the years. Background to this topic is that I like to acknowledge that shelters as much as we want them to be good places for animals to stay. They are places of trauma for animals and that it's in an unnatural environment where almost all animals are not living the same as they did right before they got there. And it's a, a stressful environment which can um, result in trauma and traumatic experiences. When we are exposed to stressors, there's kind of two different pathways that can happen. One is that if the stress that we're experiencing is predictable, which is usually not the case in the shelter environment, if the stress is mild to moderate, so mild to moderate amount of stress is good, more extreme stress is not. And if, and if it's something that's manageable and controllable, that can be a good thing and we can build tolerance and resilience and it can help us to grow and become better people or dogs or cats that we're talking about in this case. But when the stressors, stressors that we're exposed to are tend to be unpredictable, significant and prolonged, our whole body and system becomes sensitized and, and very, very vulnerable. And I talk about this to start with because this is part of why, because this is so unavoidable in many situations in the shelter, it's why uh, medications can be very important. When we talk about stress and trauma in dogs and in cats, um, there are lots of likely causes of trauma and you can you can see them listed up on on the screen but even a puppy's experiences in utero so when they're still in their mom if the mom is stressed that can have a lifelong impact on that dog's behavior and brain as it ages and these factors are why I feel it's just so very very important to do everything we can to keep um, pregnant dogs and cats and um, puppies and kittens out of the shelter environment. But lots of things in our animals' lives that can be causing trauma. So some are specifically related to the shelter, but there are lots of other reasons why the animals come to us that um, they have existing sources of stress and trauma in their backgrounds. So this um, was a dog Homer that I worked with about 10 years ago and the shelter was a very traumatic experience for him. 
um, and it can unintentionally be a very traumatic experience for many animals. And I think it's that's always a difficult topic to talk about just because we're doing our best and we're trying to help so much. But for me, part of that is acknowledging that the environment, we are inducing trauma by the environment that they're living in. And so we know there's this background of stress and trauma, and now they're here with us. What do we do? How do we know if an animal is experiencing adequate welfare? And then that's where behavior medications come into play. Um, wanted to touch briefly on affective states and the, the concept that welfare and an animal's perception of their experiences is a balance of the negative and the positive. So we can get rid of all of those negative and bad things in an animal's life, but it's still not a very good life because we need those positive things to, to get joy out of life. And so really not just thinking that, yes, we're under shelter, we're trying to get rid of all these bad things, but what good things are we adding to try to help them have a positive and good life? And this is another way of thinking about this same concept. This is called the five domains model. And it looks at all the things you can see, the tan area on the top of the screen, looks at things like nutrition, the environment that we're in, our physical health, the behavior that we're expressing. All of those things lead to what's going on inside, inside our head. So those negative and positive mental experiences that then, whoops, let me take one back, that then result in our welfare status. So we're taking all of this, everything we know about the animal to determine whether they're experiencing okay welfare, poor welfare, excellent welfare. And so when I'm thinking about behavior medications, there's a lot of different things that I'm gonna to consider to decide whether I'm going to use behavior medication. I'm going to talk about a couple of those here, and then we're just going to jump into me giving some general thoughts about different categories of animals and how I tend to treat them if I use medication in the shelter environment. But when I'm deciding whether to use, first and foremost, I'm going to do a welfare assessment related to what was described in that previous slide. What's their welfare status? I'm also going to do a risk assessment looking at multiple different risk factors. So what is the risk of this animal staying in the shelter for a long period of time based on what I know about the animal? What is the risk of the animal experiencing severe stress or welfare impairment? What is the risk of the animal harming themselves? What is the risk of them harming someone else? So I'm looking at multiple different risk factors to decide how to manage, how to treat, and whether or not to use medication. And I'm also thinking about why specifically medication is needed. As an example of that, um, if, um, so the, that picture on the right was a shelter where the fluffier dog on the left was not able to eat his food because the, the red dog on the right was guarding the food bowl and not letting the dog near it. Um, in that situation, all the medication in the world isn't gonna improve this situation. I need to get this little fluffy dog hopefully into a foster home or just out of the, the kennel from this dog. So really thinking about why the medication is needed and is there something else I can do that is going to improve things more quickly other than medication and how long will it be needed for? Okay, and so I'm going to run through here a couple of how I tend to treat things. So when I have problems that are likely to resolve over time, so this is kind of our classic, oh, that's really loud. I don't know if you guys can hear it. I'm going to pause it because it's really loud in my ears. But our classically, this is Buddy, classically super, super stressed shelter dog. He just came into the shelter environment and was very uncomfortable. And Buddy was a dog, we knew something about his history. We knew that his stress was very likely to resolve over a short time period, meaning a couple of days. So for Buddy, our, 
our treatment plan for him in, involved creating a behavior plan for him to ensure we're meeting his welfare needs, monitoring to make sure he's improvement. And I wanted to use a short acting medication with him like trazodone to reduce um, his, to increase his ability to calm down a little bit and relax and adapt to the shelter environment. So trazodone tends to be my go-to medication. I'm guessing it's a lot of your go-to medication for dogs that first come into the shelter and are really, really stressed. For cats, um, my first choice would be gabapentin. Sorry. Um, I don't use, I don't use trazodone on every pet that comes into the shelter. If a pet like little Boaz here comes into the shelter and he's um, looks fairly comfortable and relaxed and isn't showing what I observe to be signs of welfare impairment and anxiety, I'm not going to do medication. So I'm not someone who gives trazodone to almost everybody on intake. And I just wanted to be clear about that. And I'm not saying I'm doing the right thing versus someone else's if they do, but it's just how I tend to manage. Um, next, I'm going to talk very briefly about moderate to severe, severe separation anxiety, because this is oftentimes something that can be very challenging for us to find homes for and um, have them safely placed in a home where someone's going to be happy and not frustrated with them. When I talk about separation anxiety, I want to be clear that I'm talking about diagnosed separation anxiety. So this is a dog where I have video of that dog being left alone in an a home environment so that I can, can confirm that that dog has separation anxiety because so many dogs get diagnosed with it um, based on a guess and that can lead to them not getting adopted for something that is not necessarily true. Um, so if I have a young dog with confirmed separation anxiety, my go-to medication is oftentimes clomipramine. I like clomipramine for separation anxiety in younger dogs because it uh, can have antihistaminic effects and the antihistamine can be calming. So I found that it tends to be a little more um, settling for our younger dogs. And um, so I do a long acting medication, clomipramine with young dogs, fluoxetine with older dogs, and then plus or minus oftentimes a, sh a shorter acting medication to really reduce that anxiety right away. If I have concern, confirmed separation anxiety, I am always prescribing medication because I know that dog is going to need medication for adapting to a home. Um, how are we doing on time? Should I end things here? No, you have time. Okay, all right, I just have a couple more slides. So chronic anxiety, this is Fluffy. Let's look at Fluffy. So Fluffy at the time, she's a four-year-old girl. You can see her shifty gaze, tense body posture. She's sniffing to see whether the videographer is someone okay looking away because she's scared, trying to back away. Fluffy was this severely anxious dog. Outside on the walk, you can see her doing the same thing. Fluffy was fearful of everything and scared and anxious in terms of always looking out for the next thing that might cause her to be worried. In a uh, playgroup, she was a lot more comfortable. And so this one's again, stresses of the important, uh, I see her shaking off some stress there. Um, the importance of these positive, these positive experiences, because this is the one part of Fluffy's life where she got to just be a dog and relax about things. All right, let me take it there. So dogs with chronic anxiety, so they are experiencing worry, they are experiencing stress, a large portion of their lives. These are dogs that I want to put on medication, long-term medication to um, help to control and reduce that anxiety, as well as almost always 
um, shorter acting medication because usually just one medication with these severe anxiety dogs is not enough. Usually I will pick fluoxetine or Prozac for these dogs. And oftentimes I will add on gabapentin because I found that to be very, very helpful in reducing these dogs' anxiety. Um, monitoring medication, I just want to talk about and end with this, but talk about it very briefly to give us different things to think about and talk about and discuss for the rest of this session. Monitoring, monitoring medication is kind of my, my big thing I'm interested in talking about these days because I feel like many times it's a struggle to even get medication started in the shelter environment. And uh, we finally got the medication pre prescribed, huge relief, great, this dog is fixed, let me go help the next one. It's really important to look at whether that medication is actually working for that dog or that cat. So doing things like daily rounds where we're walking by their cages, oh, sorry, their cages or kennels to see um, how they are looking and doing physically making sure we're establishing baseline. So what is the baseline behavior that we see? What is the anxiety or what is the fear that they're experiencing initially so we can assess progress in terms of whether they're getting better or worse. So establishing that baseline and then tracking over time because if they're not improving on the medication, we need to be doing something different. Observing their behavior very closely, so both the positive and the negative, and as well as related to the desired effect. So if I have a dog with uh, anxiety related to thunderstorms, I need to, to make sure that that medication is reducing that level of anxiety. And I also wanna be observing for side effects. And when we're assessing whether medication is working, um, I find that it's really, really valuable for us to train and use the people such as kennel staff who are spending the most time with the dogs. They tend to know the dogs and the cats best, and it's a great way for them to increase their knowledge and skills and feel that they're really a part of something by doing this type of monitoring. But as you can see listed there, really every, you should be, we should be getting any input from everybody in terms of whether the medications are working. And there's a lot more that I could, could talk about, but I am going to end things there and I'll stop sharing, open things back up. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure people have a lot of questions or just things that are coming to mind. Um, how many of you all do use medication for your shelter pets currently? And you can use the chat or speak up. Does anyone wanna talk about what that has looked like in your organization? I will say in our shelter, we're, uh, we use trazodone quite a bit. We use gabapentin, that kind of thing. It just depends on the scenario, but I will say that the more dogs we have, the more dogs that end up being on it. So there's a direct correlation to stress as far as how many cages we have full. other people's immediate thoughts that you want to share? I have a question. Please, um, please. Did you find the enrichment that you have in the shelter help somewhat with some of this behavior in, in addition to getting medication? Do you think that if you have enrichment in the shelter that it would help some? Um, like, you know, being able to go out, being able to engage and play, um, maybe allow them to go sniff, you know, all, all of the wonderful things. Um, just, yeah, that, that you can engage the dog to help them coping with, with the kind of environment that they um, experience in the shelter setting? That's a really good 
uh, comment and I'm interested to hear how everybody else feels about that. But my experience is certainly that enrichment helps and it can help a lot. So if we're talking about that balance of positive and negative, enrichment brings that positive into a dog's life and gives them, them good things to experience, can, which can have a dramatic impact. But there are also, and so if I can, um, I am a veterinary behaviorist who tends to prescribe medication, but I also don't like prescribing medications. Uh, you know, medications are something artificial we're introducing into an animal's body. So if I can change life and impact welfare by adding enrichment or better yet, putting that dog or that cat in a foster home, that's always going to be my first choice. But there's also, as we all know, many situations where we can't get them into foster care right away. And they're a dog who doesn't like other dogs and they have to see dogs every day. And those are the situations where medications can have a really big impact and, and help to improve welfare. But I'd love to hear everybody else's thoughts about enrichment and the impact on welfare and need for medication. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for medication. I think it's very important. Um, I think without it, I think, um, I, I don't think enrichment alone is going to be able to help some of these dogs. And I think it has to kind of go hand in hand, almost. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to say it. And one example, which I haven't used in a while, but I used to always like to share with regard to the benefits of medication. Um, so I had a dog named Guapo and Guapo was a, um, he was a dog who had a really, really challenging time focusing. And when he was out in the world, everything was distracting to him. And in the home, in a calm, quiet environment in the home, he was the, the perfect dog. But you put him outside, I could put a piece of steak in front of his nose and he wouldn't eat it because he was so overwhelmed by everything in the outside world. And it wasn't until... Um, he had to have um, a hip replacement. He was a young dog with severe hip dysplasia and benefited from hip, hip replacement. And I ended up prescribing clomipramine for him as he was recovering um, because I wanted to use the sedative effect of the antihistamine and see if it helped his behavior. And I'll never forget the day with that dog where I asked him to give me eye contact, which in the home he did perfectly. Outside, he had never done before. And I said, Guapo, his name was Guapo. I said, Guapo, look. And for the first time ever, he turned his head and looked at me. And it just really shows the power of medication and why we use medication in some of these animals, because it can reduce that overall arousal and anxiety level so that their brains can be in a, in a place where they can be receptive to what we're trying to teach them. Erica, did you want to talk about what you wrote in the chat? I think she touched on it. Okay. <laughs> the most, of the, the most of the dogs that we look to medicate, and maybe it's because we're not looking to medicate enough, um, but the severe ones that we look to medicate are often the ones that, you know, are just so shut down that interacting with them, providing some sort of enrichment, like you said, they didn't, they don't want to eat. They don't want to interact. They don't necessarily want to go on a walk. That's too stressful. Um, so we don't have much in terms of enrichment. Um, we had a, a dangerous dog in our care that we had been medicated for medicating for about six months. And she, he was just so reactive that we could not safely remove him from the kennel. Um, so medication and enrichment were just about the only options that we had for him during his stay with us. Those are the, those are the worst in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Those are the worst and they're really frustrating. And when I work with and I'm working in situations where I'm managing dogs like that, this, I, I always remember them and I hang pictures of them on my wall and hope for the day when our worlds are better and we can manage these animals better and, and do a better job of meeting their needs. It's tough. 
So um, Amy wrote in the chat an interesting comment about not using behavior modification um, because it might misrepresent animals to adopters who might want to see her. Can you speak a little bit to your thoughts about that, Dr. Sagerson? Sure. And first, I want to say thank you to Amy for being brave and sharing that thought, because um, I know that there are plenty of, of shelters and people who feel the same way. If we talk to shelters in Europe, they rarely, rarely, rarely prescribe medication because they feel it's really bad to prescribe medication. And so I just want to acknowledge that we all have different viewpoints about medication. And I respect your shelter's viewpoint and everybody's different viewpoints, but I will also share my thoughts about it and, and appreciate the opportunity to talk openly about it. So the, the, the challenge for me in terms of considering versus not considering medication in the shelter environment, I certainly don't want to be giving a medication or I want to be doing everything I can to avoid giving a medication that is going to change an animal's personality or change, change their, their, who they are. But what I personally do like to do, especially with acknowledging that the shelter is not a normal environment. So we're putting an animal in a, in an abnormal environment where they're, where, where they won't be living. It's not the home environment. So they're in an unusual environment, but we're expecting them to behave the same way that they would behave in a home environment. And in my, my eyes, I, um, I, I question that expectation that of expecting them to behave normally. And because some dogs and many, many dogs that I know that are wonderful pets and have, you know, I've been doing this a long time. So I've seen lots of pets who seem to have really big challenges in the shelter and got adopted out and have now lived 16 year old lives and then died and have seen that these animals were really, really stressed because of that environment. And if I can do something to reduce the stress related to that environment, so I'm not trying to change their personality, I'm just trying to improve their welfare. Um, I've had really, really good success with that. But I also am really trying to avoid, so I'm not someone who likes to use a whole lot of trazodone because trazodone can be really, really calming. And yes, I like it for adjustment to the shelter for the first couple of days, but over the long term, um, that is something that can be making an animal, an animal seem potentially artificially calm when what we really need to be doing is providing enough enrichment or getting them to foster care, providing them with what they meet their needs. So I, I think it's great to always be questioning, am I helping this animal to cope with something that's in this environment or helping them to learn how to um, to live in this environment or live in this world, or am I doing something to to try to just drug them so I can get them to a home? That's definitely something that that I wouldn't be in support of. But I'd love other discussion around this. Amy, thoughts or anyone else? Um, just wanted to kind of echo as a foster, I've seen so, so many dogs and cats who behave completely differently in the shelter due to stress um, than they do in a home. So, you know, I, I, um, I think it's, it's foster is really important for getting an accurate rep representation of a pet's personality. I think it also depends on your, the population you're housing, because I think we've all seen those stray dogs come in and within an hour of being in the kennel, they are jumping off the walls and spinning and doing all of these negative behaviors that are outward stress. Um, and then those that come in shaking and that kind of thing. But I would say the vast majority of the dogs that we've medicated are actually not an adoption because we know that's not the end all cure all. Um, and it's just a band aid to get them to a better spot in the meantime. Um, because we just don't have a really good kennel set up. So we know that we have to move them into foster care and we're not just going to, you know, sort of sedate them in the meantime. Um, but a lot of them are strays. Um, because our, our stray hold is six days. So they normally have a minimum of seven days before they can even go up for adoption. And what are I your thoughts? Oh. That's okay. So I was just gonna say related to that dog that's 
comes in the shelter and with 20 in 24 hours they're bouncing off the walls important to acknowledge that those that stress and that behavior can lead to a downward spiral and create behavior problems in animals that didn't have them to begin with. And so that's probably the number one reason why I'm trying to get them out to foster care and or consider medication when appropriate, because I know that I can inadvertently create problems in a dog or a cat that didn't have them because of the environment. And medical problems too. Everything from that happy tail to, you know, that horse barking that they have and, you know, serrating their nails and everything else. It's just super destructive to their bodies. Yeah, for sure. Does anyone else have any questions? Anything coming to mind? Dr. Sagerson, are there, are there sort of broad uh, guidelines or anything that, that we could share with, uh, with our veterinarian or, or with, uh, someone told me recently that we might have a veterinarian in the area now who is um, specializing in behavior, although maybe not a veterinary behaviorist, but just thinking if we were to have a conversation with folks down the line, um, I'll be hiring a new vet probably next year around this time fingers crossed. So I'd um, like to have something to, to be able to, to share with someone who's not on board now. So we certainly have resources, but I um, love this question. I would love to hear from all of you and I'll be taking really good notes in terms of specifically what type of resources would be useful to you and what can the behavior support working group create and or share to to help your veterinarians or to help your shelter overall are you are you thinking of things like guidelines and recommendations for medications or what are you thinking about specific specifically well, so if I had uh, if I had our vet on this this call, you know, he might have specific questions about about you know when you when you use the you know one one over another or a specific scenario or something like that. But um, I'm just thinking along the lines of what what I'd be able to share with folks that are not part of the conversation right now, because uh, we're not doing any um, any medicating at all. We we focus on um, enrichment and um, getting animals out of the shelter as soon as possible, but um, but there might be specific animals that um, that might benefit from having some medical intervention. So, and and so if you're talking about, I'm just putting my email address in the chat. But if you're talking about specific animals and specific questions about specific animals, you can have them email me. But I would also really encourage them to join our behavior collaborative. And that's a once monthly meeting group where we talk about different behavior topics for the past uh, three months. It's been behavior medication, but there's also a email list in association with it. And I'd love to have people starting to ask questions and talk about cases through that group because it's a, a great way for us to all learn from each other. But any thoughts from anybody else about specific resources that you would love to see with regard to behavior and behavior support? It's Kathy from Canada, uh, Dr. Sigerson. We have two board certified veterinary behaviorists in the entire country, I think. <laughs> um, so definitely uh, few and far between, but even just um, we're in a position where we often end up holding dogs for extended stays from the standpoint of court holds. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I have routinely tried to get veterinarians slash the courts to understand the challenges um, that the dogs go through from a welfare standpoint. So even some kind of uh, support from a veterinary behaviorist in those circumstances, because otherwise the defendant keeps putting the court date over 
you know, I'm not even talking about COVID stuff because court just doesn't happen almost, it seems here in Ontario right now. But, um, you know, they fired their lawyer, they don't have a lawyer because of the, the challenges we have with the court system and not able to get another date for three months, those sorts of things. Um, but similar to Chris, uh, because we work with, we don't have a veterinarian on staff, we work with um, veterinary practitioners in the community, even uh, in information that can be shared with them and, and I've made note of your uh, email address, but that can be made note because they, they don't know shelter stuff and they're typically not dealing with anxiety, et cetera, related to the environment. Um, so just somewhere for them to start. And, and I would appreciate you referenced a couple of um, groups that we might share with people. And so if you've got links for those, they would be beneficial too. Well, thanks for those thoughts. And um, we'll certainly share a link to the collaborative before we end today. Um, with regard to these court cases, just in general, I wanted to mention something about those since you brought them up. And we're currently in revising the association, in the process of revising the Association of Shelter Veterinarians Standards of Care and Animal Shelters. And I'm guessing most of you have seen those. And in this uh, next revision, we're hoping to have language in there that. Um, strongly supports the needs for providing basic welfare and caring for dogs and cats in, in basic ways that will hopefully help to support stronger arguments for it not being okay to, to keep these course, court cases in care indefinitely without the resources that they need. Um, but I appreciate the, the and I also appreciate the thought about information for veterinary practitioners in the community. That's not something I had thought about and that's a, it's a really good thought and something for us to consider. So we'll add that to our to-do list of items to work on. So how, without veterinary behaviorists, how do folks do this type of medicating? Well, it's, it's certainly challenging because it depends on where you are and who you have out in your community and that there are a decent number of veterinarians who have a strong interest in behavior but don't have the capacity to embark upon a three-year residency training program. So there's an organization called the um, sorry, Canada, the America, the American Veterinary Society for Animal Behavior. And so that's a great place to find. Um, so ABSAB for short, and actually I'll type this into chat. And um, that's a great place to find veterinarians who have knowledge about animal behavior and will be knowledgeable enough with regard to prescribing medication and be a, a good resource to you. So there's a list of all the veterinarians who are members of this organization. So that's a, a great resource for you to have to find someone local. When you don't have someone local, if for in my eyes, it's really about just forming relationships with those veterinarians and making friends with them and then connecting them with people like myself or Dr. Sarah Bennett or Dr. Janine Berger, who are people who regularly work in and with shelters and, and can help private practitioners or even shelter vets to learn and grow, know more about behavior and medications. But legally shelter veterinarians can prescribe this type of medicine to their dogs and cats. For, for certain, yeah, so legally, Shelter veterinarians can prescribe if it's a controlled drug or a controlled medication. Obviously, there's specific um, issues there that we need a, a special license for. But legally, yes, certainly, shelter vets can prescribe. And then when you're moving animals, and I'm assuming animals in most organizations that are on behavior um, medication, are probably being, you know, triaged to foster homes as quickly as possible. So 
Do you recommend animals stay on those medications while they're transitioning to their home? Um, and what does that look like? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know. I just um, got a new dog a couple of days ago and he's, I put him outside so he wouldn't interrupt our meeting and he's banging on the door. I hope he's not bothering everybody. But in terms of transitioning to foster homes, this is always a challenging situation in that, um, yes, if they're on medication, it is rare that I'm going to just cold turkey stop the medication unless it's something like they've been in the shelter for two days, they're on shelter, they're on trazodone to manage anxiety related to that transition. They're in a, they're going to foster and they won't be anxious anymore that then I will cold turkey. Almost every other reason I am going to prefer, strongly prefer to allow that animal to adapt to that home, adjust to that home. The home is an amazing place, but it's still an environment environmental change and is going to be stressful. And once they've adapted and settled in, then we talk about, so usually I wait um, with most animals, especially that have been on medication for longer than a couple of weeks, wait two weeks. And then after two weeks, then we start to, if they're doing really well and the reason they're on medication don't exist anymore, then we'll start to wean them off of medication. Um, but it's really important to talk to the shelters, uh, I'm sorry, to the fosters about why the medication is being supported prescribed that we are not drugging the animal, we are giving medication to help their welfare and anxiety. So to help them really understand why they're on the medication, because most foster homes tendency is just a cold turkey, cut them off. And then sometimes very, very rarely, but theoretically they can get really sick from the medication being discontinued abruptly. So we certainly wanna avoid doing that whenever possible. So over the, the long amount of time that you've been doing this work, how have you seen medication shift for, you, for use um, with shelter animals? How much has it changed? Oh, it's changed um, hugely and dramatically. And that when I was, when I first started working in shelters, medication was not something that was even being considered at all, really. I'm trying to think. Yeah, when I when I first started, we, you know, except as related to anesthesia for a procedure, we were never um, giving any medication that could be perceived as a behavior medication. And um, as time has gone on, um, I I feel like two main things have happened. One, we gain knowledge about trauma. We've gained knowledge about stress in people and in animals. So we're a lot more aware of the impact of the shelter environment and aware of our need to help and support. But then also as our life-saving practices improve and the simple, easier animals are getting out of the shelter more quickly, we do have animals who come with significant trauma histories or significant negative past experiences. And those animals, in my opinion, deserve our help, deserve our support to try to help them to live their best lives. And, and that's where I feel things have really changed. Instead of saying, you're not perfect, I can't help you, we can't save you. It's, it's more and more considering, can I safely place you in a home environment? And if the answer to that is yes, okay, let's help you along that path. And oftentimes that includes behavior medication. Does that answer your question? It definitely does. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I, I was thinking a resource that might be helpful too is for shelters to give to foster homes. Um, if they're going home with medication, it might be nice to have just like a one pager that we can share um, that just outlines the importance and everything that you just said. That's a great um, idea. There was, and if we're all using the same one of some of these, like I think that always helps um, when we're all using the same kind of language. So um, there's a couple of other questions in the chat. So one of them is about Reiki as a treatment option. Um, thoughts about Reiki as a treatment option? 
My thoughts about Reiki, um, Renee, thank you for bringing that up, is that it's something that I am embarrassed to say I know almost nothing about. And I've heard about it. I've heard people have having really good success with it, but that is all I know. Renee, can you tell us, tell me a little bit about it? Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, um, I worked in shelters for for many years and I'm um, on a, a different side of, of the industry, but basically I was a, a Reiki practitioner and mass, Reiki master myself. Um, and we were fortunate to have a couple really experienced Reiki professionals in the community come in and volunteer at the shelter, um, which is where I learned it from. But basically it's, it's just um, like an energy healing type of work. Um, it's, it's people often think it's, it's, you know, religious or spiritual, and that's not the case at all. It's, it's really about creating um, balance in, in systems with um, the energy that's all around us and, and within all of us. And so you talked early on about the trauma that these animals can experience um, before they come into the shelter and at the shelter. And that's exactly what Reiki can do is just um, create a sense of balance with, with um, people or animals who have experienced trauma. And so um, it's really basically just gently resting your hands on certain parts of an animal's body um, to facilitate some, some healing. And you'll, a, a practitioner will really quickly see and feel um, a shift happen. And I've seen it personally with cats, feral cats who were um, just completely um, terrified in a setting. I've seen it with dogs, puppies, um, every kind of case you can imagine, I, I've seen animals respond positively to. So you of course do wanna have um, trained professionals uh, working with these animals, but there are a lot of uh, Reiki practitioners out there that would I'm sure love to come in and help in shelters in every community. Cool, thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate because as I said, I've, I've heard about it, but I really knew very little and now I know a little more, which is good. And I am um, always someone who is a fan of learning and growing and there are lots of, there are lots of things that I don't know a lot about how they work. Acupuncture is another one. I am a fan of acupuncture, but I don't know exactly how it works, but I have seen it help animals behaviorally when nothing else helped and um, Eastern medicine as well. And I think when we have more challenging animals, the the concept that you're talking about with Reiki in terms of bringing them into balance is a lot of what we need with these animals and finding yes. ways to do it. Um, Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. I have another question for you too. And thank you, Renee, for sharing all of that. Um, it's really awesome to just hear that we're increasing tools for animals to de-stress. Um, and work through trauma. So do you think that medication slows down the trauma that happens in a shelter or are we mostly treating past traumas or both? That's a really good question. I don't know. I, um, I would, if I just had to guess and theorize, I would guess that it's really, really, really challenging to heal from past traumas in the shelter environment. And that's, um, we're really ma mainly trying to, to help them to get by in the, the, the best possible way. So I would guess that it mainly helps with their current experience, but it also depends on the shelter environment and and how much stress and trauma they're experiencing. If I have a, an amazing shelter environment where people spend, where dogs and cats spend most of their time with people and their welfare is excellent, um, then that's potentially, potentially an environment where medication can be helping with healing. But who knows? Thank you so much. And I realize we only have a few minutes left, which um, I could ask you questions about this for <laughs> ever. 
Um, it's super interesting and just really, really helpful information. So thank you for being here. Um, is there any type of research that's happening now that organizations that are using medication either in shelter and foster homes should be aware of and participate in potentially? That's a really good question. I know about small behavior projects here and there. Some of you might be involved in, uh, is anyone here involved in Arizona State University's safety net fostering program? I see Chris, you are, I, I can't see everybody, but um, that's one project that I know of, which is a really exciting project to have um, members of the public foster an animal who's at risk of relinquishment to um, keep it from coming into the shelter. And you might say, well, foster is behavior. For me, um, it, it was my experience in sheltering was very, very interesting. And in that over time learning that the number one thing I can do to help animals behaviorally is to get them into foster care. And that's why I talk about it so much. And, Oh, Geraldine, thanks for sharing that San Diego is part of it too. Um, other projects, I cannot, there aren't a ton of projects right now, but I will keep thinking about that. And as I hear about them and think about them, I think that's a great uh, thought and suggestion where I'll make sure to share them out with everybody so everybody knows about what's going on and has an opportunity to participate. Thank you so much for this generative conversation. I feel like it's just really important for us to all sort of hear from the experts about um, what we can do to make shelter stay less stressful for dogs and cats in our care. So thank you for being here. And um, you shared your email in the chat so people can follow up with questions. For sure, I um, love to talk behavior. And so, yeah, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or share my email address for other people. And if you're not in the behavior collaborative, thank you, Eliza, for sharing that link there. Um, be sure to join it. You'll just be put into the email list so that you can ask questions if you want to, and then um, get the invite to the, our monthly meetings. Thank you so much. It's been so awesome to have you here. I imagine we'll probably ask you back um, and uh, hope you can come talk to us more about behavior. So thanks everybody for being here. It's always wonderful to see you all and have a wonderful rest of your week. And thanks so much, Sheila. Thanks everyone. You're welcome. Thanks Dr. Sagerson. You're welcome, bye.